people, I'd like to apologize for the scar on my nose. I didn't get into a fight with anyone. I'm always good to my wife. <laughs> but unfortunately, I had to have a surgery. Three, actually. I've just had one. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to look great for the next few weeks as each procedure is done. So, uh, but it's a good thing to get, to get rid of all this while, you know, while everything is nice and safe. So, uh, sorry about that. My dear friends, our topic today is the alchemy of happiness. And it's the alchemy of happiness in turbulent times where we are today. Now, happiness today is in very short supply. Wherever we look, we see wars, killing of innocents, injustice, a complete breakdown of the norms of humanity as we know it and as we grew up believing in. We are in essence living in an era of what I would call moral bankruptcy at so many levels, leaving us sad, angry, with our spirits dampened and lots more. Added to that, life as a whole is generally getting more and more difficult for a variety of reasons. So that is the state of our turbulent world today. And we have to journey through life in this world. And we have to journey through it with happiness and accomplish what we came here to achieve. So let's accept the realities before us, that the world is as it is. Now we're going to find how best can we journey through it and still be happy and still accomplish. And how do we carve our own path forward, each one of us? Hence, I'd like to take a few moments today to talk about the alchemy of happiness, through which we can navigate through life with happiness, clarity and fulfillment. Now, why do I choose the word alchemy? Alchemy, which has an Arabic form of alchemia, and there's also a Greek name as well, but alchemy is an ancient branch of, na of natural philosophy, a philosophical and proto-scientific tradition that was historically practiced in China, India, and the Muslim world and Europe. Now, alchemy is a natural philosophy, not an exact science, but it can deliver apparently magical results. And finding happiness in our current world is now bordering on the magical, my dear friends. Hence, I chose the title Alchemy of Happiness for today's insight. So let us explore a few philosophies which we can adopt successfully to enable us to live the magic of happiness today. And I will share seven of them with you today. Philosophy number one is to develop an enabling mindset towards life. To develop an enabling mindset towards life. Now I'd like to start with this very important philosophy, which I recently expressed in one of my quotes. And it goes, happiness comes from following life rather than trying to lead it. Happiness comes from following life rather than trying to lead it. Now most of us have grown up with the misconception that we should lead life and its events. What qualifies any of us to lead life and its events? Yet it seems natural for us to do so unquestioningly. The truth is Life just is. Life happens. And we experience what happens. We have no power to lead life. Yet we believe that we should create events and outcomes that suit our expectations. On the face of it, it sounds perfectly okay to do so. However, we frequently fall into the age-old trap, which is to attach ourselves to the outcomes of our choosing at the times of our choosing. And guess what happens? Things don't go according to plan. They seldom do, most of the time. So where does that leave us? Disappointed, angry, 
frustrated and sad amongst others. In the midst of all this, where can we find the headspace to focus and appreciate on the things that make us happy? We don't have headspace. So the problem, my dear friends, is not in having a goal. We should all have goals. That's good. But we should avoid getting attached to the outcomes of our goals and be consumed by the timelines that we set for their accomplishment. Attachment is the culprit here. Now, since this is such an important concept and very easy to misinterpret, let me share an example with you for clarity's sake, because I'm not saying do not have goals, but I'm saying do not get attached to the outcome and do not be consumed by the timelines you have set for these outcomes because you control neither. So Mark is a young man who is striving hard to build his tech business, which is a startup. Mark has started, has signed deals with two companies whose technologies he is going to license. So let us call them Tech 1 and Tech 2. Next, he needs to raise funding to pay for Tech 1 and Tech 2 and build up his business. So he goes to the banks, but none of them want to fund his business because it is a startup, very risky. So he starts looking for other sources of funding. And this is where he meets a young man by the name of Tom. Tom has a lot of experience in financing companies like Marx. And Tom also needs this business because he has to meet some debt obligations whose time is running out. So both Mark and Tom are in the same boat. So Tom lays out a plan where he is going to approach four different investment avenues. He tells Mark that he estimates that the funding could be completed within, say, three months, barring any unforeseen delays. Now, Mark panics because he is committed to pay for Tech 1 and Tech 2 licenses in two months' time, and Tom's talking about three. But he has no choice but to work hard with Tom and provide all the documents needed for the financing. So Mike focuses on, Mark focuses on the work, and Tom moves forward as, far as, as fast as he can go to help Mark. Now, Mark has attached himself to the expectation that he will be funded within the next three months. Mark has pinned his hope on the fact that at least one of the four investment funds will come through. He is completely consumed by this expectation and calls Tom five times a day to get an update. Five times a day. Mark can't even sleep at night. He completely ignores his wife and children and lives in an anxiety-filled state, smoking two packets of cigarettes each day. Mark is on the edge every moment. Tom, on the other hand, is calm and doing his best without getting into any state of anxiety, despite the serious debt repayment pressures that he has on him. Tom spends time with his wife and children and lives a completely normal life and a happy life while still working very hard and doing his best. So here we are, Mark, an unhappy, nervous wreck, and Tom, who is calm, effective, and happy. And both are on the same boat, going to the same destination, yet in completely different states of mind. So what happens next? At the end of three months, the deadline comes, none of the financings come through. They are all moving slower than ever because of bureaucracy and regulatory compliance issues and more. Tech 1 and Tech 2, they back out of their deal with Mark, leaving him devastated. Mark is very, very unhappy. And Tom reassures him that, look, Mark, the game is not over and that none of the investors have declined to fund. They are all working on it. It's just that the process is moving slower than expected. Tom starts scanning the market for a new technology licensor for Mark and comes across the perfect fit, Company Tech 3. They sign up with Mark. Tech 3 is a far better company 
offering solutions that are leagues ahead of Tech One and Tech Two. In addition, the principles of Tech One, the principles of Tech One and Tech Two, were very difficult, egoistic people, and extremely hard to deal with. So Mike, Mark would have had a very rough time. By contrast, Tech Three was led by a fantastic team of principals who are a lot easier to deal with. So Mark is very glad to have Tech Three, but he's still not happy. He keeps setting deadline after deadline and the funds don't arrive at any of his deadlines, making Mark super frustrated. Finally, at the end of six months, the funding comes through. And his funding is oversubscribed because of Tech 3. So Mark is funded for the next five years. So you would say, well, this is a far better outcome than he'd ever hoped for. So what do we see here? Mark has lost six months of his life in pure unhappiness, but he's not alone. His wife and family have suffered equally with him. Tom, on the other hand, has remained calm and effective, bringing Mark a better deal and delivering all the funds he needed to build his startup. So Tom did not lose a single moment in the six months trying to force events to suit his expectations. He just did his best and followed life where it took him. The story has a good ending. Mark goes on to build a highly successful company, but is never happy because he keeps trying to force every subsequent event to fit his desire and expectations. Now, what did life do for Mark? How did life come through for Mark? Number one, life gets rid of two bad partners through delays. Had the funding arrived on time, Mark would have been stuck with a painful road ahead with Tech One and Tech Two and their principles. And maybe he may not have been able to even raise as much as he did. So through this delay, Life delivers to Mark the perfect partner and all the funding he needs for the next five years. Life does actually come through for Mark in an amazing way. But instead of being happy and grateful, Mark is busy chasing and trying to force the next set of events, losing precious time, precious happiness, and most of all, irreplaceable moments with his wife and children. So in our final analysis, was Mark, right, was Mark right about setting his goals and working hard towards achieving them? Sure he was. But where he went wrong was attaching himself to timelines and deadlines of outcomes that could not materialize within the time of his choosing. That's where he went wrong. Mark continued to battle with forcing life in a specific direction just as he could not, but just as he could not make it happen, he kept getting more and more frustrated, even though he became more and more successful. I guess he was trying to play God without knowing it. In the midst of all this, he also missed other great opportunities for his company that passed him by because he had no headspace to focus on them. So my dear friends, trying to lead life and force outcomes can be exhausting. It can be like pushing up a huge boulder up a steep hill. And that's what Mark tried to do. So what advice would we give to Mark today, my dear friends? We would say to him, happiness comes from following life rather than trying to lead it. The events of our lives are going to transpire the way they need to. And when they need to, we cannot control that. What we can do is work hard and do our best. And after that, surrender to life and follow where it takes us. This way we will be free of anxiety and unhappiness. We can enjoy our lives and participate in all the important, meaningful moments that only come our way once. So this is the first and most important philosophy in the alchemy of happiness that I wanted to share with you today. My dear friends, today, don't let the news and the state of our world and all the challenges you face drag you down. 
Those are simply elements of life. Accept them as so. They are simply elements of life. They will come and they will go. But do your best and follow them as they unfold. Follow life as it unfolds and marvel at how such amazing plans do materialize in the end, in their own way and in their own timing, like you saw what happened for Mark. The key is to be patient and not to attach yourself to any event or its timing. The key is to always be happy and grateful. This way we can all pass through our challenging and transformative times together, happily. And if we ever get into expectation-driven, anxious states, remember Mark and Tom. Choose the path of Tom, always. Now we can go to the next few philosophies, the six, but next six ones, but much quicker, as they are more clear-cut and less prone to misinterpretation. Philosophy two is to avoid blind acceptance of what you see and read about. Avoid blind acceptance of what you see and read about. Here, my dear friends, we, again, we live in a period of intended and unintended manipulation. We're bombarded with fake news in subtle and blatant forms. Now, we all grow up believing, we believing in newsprint and television as being gospel. That's how we were raised. But in today's fast-paced, ever-manipulated world, this is no longer true. While AI is a great tool, it can also be abused. For example, AI can replicate a person's video and convert it into a terrible version. Many examples of famous actors and actresses and various highly respected members of society are being projected in pornographic and or compromising videos that are all fake. Now, if we saw them, we would think, oh my goodness, it takes AI seconds to do this. Today, AI can take my voice and replicate it with me saying exactly the opposite of what I believe in. If you heard it, you would think it's true. News videos are frequently created of events that never happened. Print articles are also often written in totally misleading ways with distorted facts. In a recent conflict, there was a video of a nun who said she was under siege and being abused by her attackers. She was terrified for her life. She was really building up this tempo of something horrible happening to her. It turns out she was an actress and none of that ever happened. Three, four days later, that video got debugged. Both sides of the conflict, both sides of every conflict, project this kind of fake stuff to sway public opinion. There's a great movie called Wag the Dog, which came out in 1997, Wag the Dog, starring Dustin Hoffman as a spin doctor. If you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. You will enjoy it thoroughly. It's highly entertaining and you will get an insight on how easily the masses can be manipulated by fabrications that appear absolutely real. Do watch it. It'll be fun. And remember, this came out in 1997 when AI was not even there. So today, a smart person and a laptop is all you need to generate new alternate realities. It's that easy. So my dear friends, philosophy too is to absolutely stop believing any of what you see or read in social media and the news media. If you are really interested in knowing something, dig deep, do your own wide-based research and then draw your own conclusions. Because always two sides of the story are always presented. You can choose what you believe to be right. Otherwise, it's time to be highly skeptical. And that way, what you see and read won't have the same dampening and negative effect on you. You can free yourself and allow your state of mind to be in happiness, hope and positivity instead use your time in that direction. This brings us to philosophy three. And philosophy three is limit your exposure 
to the smartphone, tablet, and TV, etc. Limit your exposure to the smartphone, tablet, and TV, etc. All these gadgets. Philosophy 3 is a follow-on from philosophy 2. They are connected. So to gain clarity and freedom, to discover happiness in our daily lives, we need to severely curtail the amount of time we spend on these sources of bombardment of fake news and misleading concepts of life as a whole. On social media, we see people showing glamorous lifestyles that are actually pushed on us and products that are projected on us that make our lives seem pale and inadequate compared to what we see. But most of this is just a show. Very little is true. I have seen some of it firsthand myself and I keep scratching my head going, wow, look at this show. I mean, I look where the uh, video is taken and how it's projected and it, it just leaves me amazed. But you know, you can fool the peep, peep masses all the time if the masses are glued to wanting to follow this stuff. Even the internet is full of wrong information on, for example, health and alternate remedies, because there is zero regulation on what one can and cannot post on the internet. So I was several times come across these things, or people send me stuff to comment on, like, oh my God. But there's a lot of wrong, misleading information that can even be dangerous. I've seen utter nonsense in some cases on health-related information and natural remedies with no scientific logic. Some of it, as I said, is actually dangerous, but people follow blindly. Why? Because it's out there, it's on print. No, it's not. Somebody now, if, if, even in a newspaper, there's an editor who edits. On the internet, any of us can go and put whatever we want. And there'll be people watching, reading, and believing. So people follow blindly. There was a man who overdosed on carrot juice here in Spain many years ago because he was following a carrot-only diet program, carrots-only diet program which he had seen on the internet. He actually got killed. He died of poisoning. So excessive taking of carrots and the minerals and all the metals that are in them can kill you. And that's what happened to him. So my dear friends, we do need to go into a detox phase by setting aside our phones, tablets, and TVs for a period of time. We need this detox, very helpful. And if we cannot have an absolute detox, we do actually significantly limit our exposure to these things. That too is part of a detox. There are so many interesting things we can do with our time, which we have stopped doing. Just cast your mind back to the things you used to do before social media and internet and all this came along. What were you doing and yet how were you having fun? What are the things you were doing that you have stopped doing? At the end of the detox, we can come out with a heavily reduced usage of our exposure, usage and exposure to these gadgets and balance it out with the new activities that we have adopted during the detox phase. So this would be my recommendation. Do the detox, reorganize, and come out. And I'm not saying give up these things forever, but come back with balance. This is important. Philosophy four, spend a lot of time with nature. Spend a lot of time with nature. Philosophy four is connected to philosophy three. My dear friends, nature is a powerful grind, a grounding force for us all. Nature is real. There is no fakeness to it. So we, who too are real, need to connect with nature, which is real, every day. This will reinforce our own inner strength and belief in what is real. In a world that is so full of illusions, this grounding is essential. At one point, it was nice to have. Today, it's essential. It's like eating and drinking water and taking your meds. Let's get grounded in nature every day. Go to the park, go to the beach, walk barefoot on the grass or sand. It's so therapeutic. I mean, look, the whole science of reflexology works with the sensors that are at the base of our feet. If you walk 
barefoot on, on natural earth, you're actually healing your body. Spot the birds and the beautiful creatures of nature and learn about them, be they on land, water, or in the air. I believe you can all come up with your own ways of enjoying and internalizing and appreciating nature. So I'll leave that part with you. Even looking at the stars and the universe in a, for a few minutes in the night can be deeply grounding, provoking profound thinking within our minds because it's such a vast, beautiful, powerful setting. So philosophy four deserves a disciplined action plan. And as we begin to enjoy nature, we will automatically make it a priority. This brings us to philosophy five, the material and spiritual balance. So philosophy five follows from philosophy four. Nature connects us with what is real. Our spirituality also grounds us in what is real. So the two go hand in hand. Our material existence is getting more and more illusionary, as we have just discussed, and yet today we give it higher priority over what is real. Therefore, it's time to switch to a balance between the material and the spiritual. And we can start by taking more time for prayer, meditation, contemplation, and enlightened thought each day. We can also start by those special moments of silence and deep thought, taking the time to be grateful for everything, for example, and expressing gratitude as a part of our consciousness is also a powerful grounding force in the real. So we have to go back and keep grounding ourselves in what is real. So all this plus immersion in nature is a perfect counterbalance to our illusion-filled material existence. True happiness, my dear friends, emerges from within our beings when we are grounded in the real. Now, balance between the material and spiritual is most important. Living in either of the extremes doesn't get us very far. Balance is what we are looking for. The material world also offers us much learning and growth, and we cannot forget that. However, we need to be grounded in reality to experience it in a wholesome way and learn from it. In our first webinar of the year, I talked about insights for 2024, and I do recommend you visit that video on our YouTube channel or revisit it if you've seen it, where this and other important aspects are discussed further. So as you're planning your own way forward, drawing on the alchemy of happiness, Go back to that video and pick up some more from there. Philosophy six, increased physical contact with people. Increased physical contact with people. Here, my dear friends, our body, mind, and emotions are all wired in a way that makes physical contact with other human beings essential. It is part of our alchemy, that contact. We were never designed to live in social isolation. I mean, even our physical health depends on physical contact with one another. For example, it is a proven fact that women age faster without physical touch, especially as they grow older. The touch produces endorphins and biochemicals that keep them healthy. You can all research the power of physical contact further if you wish. Mental and emotional contact are similar and their importance is obvious. Now, when we are with other people, we pick up each other's energies, thought waves, vibrations, and more. All this makes our being function in a more healthy manner. COVID resulted in most of us becoming more insular as we endured the physical, mental, and emotional damage of isolation. Depression reached an all-time peak, understandably, and many have not recovered from it. And the best way to press the reset button is to go out and connect with others as frequently as possible. Similarly, people who have isolated themselves through living in social media bubbles, immerse them in virtual life experiences, also suffer its physical, mental, and emotional impact. 
Many of the younger generation are actually becoming socially awkward. They do not know how to communicate with others, you know, in a face-to-face -face context. And suicide rates in this generation is very much on the rise. Happiness, my dear friends, comes from a good health of being as a whole. And our physical contact with one another plays a big part in our well-being. There's plenty of scientific proof of that, of what I'm sharing here. And of course, the logic is undeniable. If you're interested in the subject, do research it further. And this brings me to the final philosophy, which is the seventh philosophy. Limit exposure to toxic relationships and situations. Limit exposure to toxic relationships and situations. And here, my dear friends, we are all exposed to people, relationships, and situations that dampen our spirits and drag us down. That's just part of life. However, to live in happiness, we need to consciously limit our exposure to such downers. And each of us has our own way of dealing with this and achieving this. If you wake up happy in the morning and by noon you are down, it is time to pause and reflect. Think of an old weighing scale, like the ones we had many years ago before the scales with analog and digital dials appeared. The old scale had a metal dish on which you placed whatever you wanted to weigh, and on the other side weights were placed, and the two sides, when they balanced, that's how we recorded the weight. Weights on one side, dish on the other. Okay. So your happiness in this scale rests on the side of the scale with the dish. That's where it rests, your happiness. When you're happy, this side goes all the way down to the grounding level, which rests on the table on which the scale sits. So the grounding level defines your state of being. When happiness is your grind, grounding level and the scale is right down, the dish is right down, it's a great space to be. Your toxic relationships and spirit dampening situations exist in the weights. As they pile up one by one, they push happiness upwards and away from its grounding level. And the weights take over the grounding and they hit the table. Hence you are now grounded in unhappiness and negativity. So test your emotions frequently with this scale, especially when you feel down. At this point, look for the weights that have driven you down and start taking them off your scale one by one till happiness is now your grounding again. Limiting exposure to toxic people, relationships and situations is a good way to reduce the weights and allow yourself to be grounded in happiness. It's a very helpful technique as it helps us identify each one of the weights so that we can actively limit our exposure to them and deal with them. To the best extent possible, of course. That goes without saying. I mean, sometimes it's not possible to limit your exposure, especially if you are stuck in certain situations. Then one has to learn ways of working with the situation and reduce its impact on one's state of being. Like changing perspectives and reducing sensitivity are two good examples to work with, options to work with, and there are more. So my dear friends, I've just shared seven of the philosophies that make up the alchemy of happiness. And there are lots more, and you can add your own. I shared some of the critical ones today that tie well into each other and can hopefully keep us grounded in happiness which today is magical in light of where our world is going. But it's possible because alchemy is based on natural philosophies that are aligned with nature to deliver magical outcomes. I pray you may always be graced with immense material and spiritual happiness, always.